um, um, we'll may wait just a couple of minutes to see if we have anyone else join not too long. And then we'll get started. And while we're doing that, um, I'm Laura Harmon, the project manager for the Unified Development Ordinance and have a number of staff with us tonight. Um, won't introduce everyone, but I want to introduce Allison Craig, our um, actually our interim planning director. Um, it's been our deputy planning director throughout this process. Uh, Yolanda Jones, who is on the UDO team, Sandra Montgomery, uh, Andrew Ossel, Kevin May, Mariah Wozniak, and I, I hope I, hopefully I caught everyone from the team. We have some other staff here tonight. Um, so with that, let's get into the meet. We have a lot of information we want to present to you. Um, hopefully we'll give you uh, more of an idea of what's in the UDO and help you use it. If you need clarification on anything we present tonight, um, you can do so in the chat box. And while we're at it, you get a chance to just introduce yourself in the chat box, um, what organization you represent, if any, um, that would be great. And we will attempt to respond to questions and comments at the end of the meeting. And I also realized that I forgot to introduce Arista Strungis with Camiris, who um, has been our consultant for the UDM. Um, so again, uh, the purpose of this meeting is really to highlight changes to development regulations in the UDO, um, to focus on high level changes rather than site specific, specific standards, um, and try to answer some of the questions submitted by uh, attendees. And we uh, are not talking about short-term rentals. That's, we got a lot of um, questions about that coming in um, for the meeting. So we're gonna have a separate meeting on that um, in uh, probably February, maybe early March, um, because there is a lot of interest in that topic. And um, our presentation is largely geared towards folks who work in the uh, real estate industry. We anticipate also having a session in the upcoming months for uh, folks, residents of our community, um, less frequent users than maybe some of some of the folks that have signed up for these sessions. I'm gonna hand this off to Mariah now. Thank you, Laura. Um, this slide may be familiar to several of you. Um, it is our key UDO schedule dates um, and it outlines um, where we are in the process right now. So um, it reflects our recent schedule adjustment, which um, extended our public comment period to on the first UDO draft until March 18th. Um, we are reviewing the public comments we're receiving on a rolling basis, and we're doing so now. Um, and we'll continue to do that um, and incorporate those into the second UDO draft, which is set for release in May of 2022. Um, this schedule aims for City Council public hearing and planning committee recommendation in June, um, with the target UDO adoption date um, in July. So what is the connection? Um, one of the major roles of the UDO is to provide the regula regulations needed to implement the vision established by the City Council Adopted Comprehensive Plan um, and other city adopted policies. So we are taking regulations from eight different places and updating them and consolidating them into one singular development ordinance. Um, most folks are probably familiar with the zoning ordinance, but um, the UDO also includes subdivision trees, streets and sidewalks, post-construction stormwater, floodplain, um, and the others that you see here. So not only are we working to align the development regulations with one another, um, but we're also aligning them with the city council adopted policies. So why develop a UDO? Um, like I said, it serves as the primary regulatory tool for implementation of the comprehensive plan. Um, it also helps to create more predictability in future development in Charlotte, all while aligning the development regulations um, so that they work well together. Um, also important to note that the UDO um, aims to incorporate best practices and revise development standards. And this is all um, funneling into hopefully a more user-friendly ordinance that seeks to simplify terms and create common language across the document and increase the use of graphics. Uh, and lastly, one of the 
another important reason um, is to comply with the North Carolina 160D um, legislation. So the UDO is essentially comprised of five broad buckets outlined here. Um, and on today's conversation, we'll be digging into major highlights from zoning, stormwater and natural resources, subdivision streets and other infrastructure, as well as administration. Um, beyond the five broader sections, the UDO is uh, officially organized into 13 parts. So as you see here, each part is comprised of one or more of the UDO's 40 articles. Um, and what you see on the slide is kind of the more formal organization, like I said, um, and can show you exactly where you might find specific, well, you, where you will find, excuse me, um, specific standards or regulations that you're looking for. So for example, um, the general development zoning standards are um, part eight of the ordinance and they include articles 16 through 22. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Laura um, to speak about some zoning highlights. Thank you, Mariah. Um, typically, Alan Goodwin would be covering this. He's managed the zoning portion of the UDO. Um, he's out for a few weeks, so I'm gonna take over for him and we can go to the next slide. So we have a number of new zoning districts in the UDO. They are based on the place types from the comprehensive plan. And I'll just go through quickly and show you um, how the place types have been taken from broad policy to becoming, um, going to regulatory language through the UDO and the zoning districts in the UDO. So the neighborhood one place type, and hopefully folks are familiar with comprehensive plan and the place types and even the place type mapping going on now. Neighborhood one, there are four, or, sorry, six zoning districts to implement um, that place type. For neighborhood two, we have um, three zoning districts. So um, totally new zoning districts, new names, and we'll talk a little bit about how we get from where we are now to those new zoning districts. Next slide. Um, we have a series also of employment districts um, uh, based on the four uh, employment place types. The first being um, the commercial place types where we have two districts, three campus districts, two manufacturing and logistics districts, and one district for um, innovation mixed use. So um, if you go into the ordinance, you will see the ordinance is um, largely organized for the zoning piece around these districts. Next slide. And then the center's place type, um, three types of centers. And um, these are areas that have a mixture of uh, retail office and residential. So they also have an employment and residential along with them. And you can see um, we have one neighborhood center district, two community activity center districts, and three regional activity center districts. And we also have the transit-oriented development um, or TOD districts that are appropriate in certain locations within our centers. Um, a little bit more on zoning districts. This is the last slide of, of new zoning districts. We have the historic district overlay, um, which is a a slightly updated version of what we have today. And then three new districts that apply to our neighborhood one place type that could be overlaid over the base district. We have the cottage court overlay, neighborhood character overlay, and a residential infill overlay um, that will be area specific. Then we have two districts that deal with manufactured homes and also uh, a district for the airport noise disclosure which is also something in our current ordinance. Next slide. So how do we get from where we are today in the districts maybe that you're familiar with to our new um, UDO zoning districts? So we have a translation table and zoning, existing zoning that is conventional. In other words, um, does not have a site plan, a conditional site plan associated with it. Um, so it's not a CD plan, it's not an optional um, rezoning plan, but conventional districts will translate on the effective date of the ordinance. So for example, our current B1 zoning, all the sites that are zoned B1 without a conventional plan 
will translate to the general commercial, the CG district. And so you can see um, in the ordinance in table 3.1, um, all of the um, translations and how those districts will translate. Um, next slide. A little bit about the zoning standards you'll find in the UDO. We have um, some standards that you're probably very used to um, with uh, lot sizes, lot widths, setbacks, um, building height, but we also um, have parking, open space loading, sorry. Um, but we also have some new types of standards um, like the bill two zones and bill two percentage so we've used in the TOD districts with building siding to maximum heights, a bonus table, and I'll talk about that for heights, um, a number of building, building articulations. Some of that is in our zoning ordinance, such as blank walls in some of our urban districts. But a lot of these are updated um, best practice standards similarly for transparency and a lot of building design. And then we do have open space, parking, similar, different approach, but types of standards we have now, loading and service standards, landscaping and screening, and then signs, which was updated a few years ago and incorporated into the draft UDA. Next slide. So if you're a user of the UDO, um, whether on a frequent basis or infrequent basis, these are a few things we thought would be good for you to know. Many of the zoning standards are controlled by a street's frontage or a site's frontages. So a frontage would be along a street based on a street classification. It may be along a transit line, um, maybe abutting a park, but those um, edges of the property, um, each of those sides would be frontages. And setbacks are an example of a standard that's controlled by a frontage. So if your site fronts on a main street, then it may have a different setback than if it fronts on a four to five lane avenue or boulevard, another frontage type. And we do have nine frontage types in all. And if you wanna dig into that a little bit more, it's on pages three, four through three, six of the ordinance. Another thing to know is setbacks in all districts except the neighborhood one districts are measured from the future back of curb. Currently, most districts measure setbacks from right of way, so that is a change. Um, future back of curb location for non-local streets is on the Charlotte Streets map, which is in a draft form also. Hopefully you're familiar with that and been looking, on, looking at that and commenting on it. Um, and then for local and collector streets, the future back of curb location is identified in each zoning district. And then finally, there is a bonus table in the UDO in um, section 16.3. And this allows, <coughs> excuse me, additional height or open space, space bonuses um, if you um, have certain actions. So if you provide a certain amount of affordable housing, or additional open space or um, electronic mobility lockers, you can get additional height um, primarily um, in these ordinances. And in some cases, um, again, that if you provide additional open space, um, you can get some deviations from standards. Um, so another thing to be aware of, this is based up largely on what is in the transit oriented development districts, which were adopted a couple of years ago and really of a precursor for um, the UDO zoning districts. Next slide. Um, uses, a little bit different approach from what we have now and hopefully more consolidated. We have um, one chat, one article, article 15 that is focused on uses. Um, it talks, defines all of the uses, provides definitions. These are separated from the general development um, definitions, and also the prescribed conditions for uses when those apply. And then we have a table that shows you for each zoning district, which uses are allowed. So if you um, can read this at the top of the table, you can see that a drive-through establishment is allowed with prescribed conditions. That's what the PC means in the table in the ML1 and ML2 districts. And this um, 
this is a place where you can go and find where all uses are allowed, where they're, where they're not allowed, whether or not they're prescribed conditions. Um, and in some cases, a use may require a conditional rezoning. Um, if you look at the table in the grayed out cells, that means that that use is not allowed in those same districts. Next slide. Um, want to talk a little bit about the neighborhood one A through E zoning districts. There is a neighborhood one um, F, but want to focus on A through E because you probably have heard a lot about um, this concept through the comprehensive plan. These districts allow single family duplex and triplex dwellings on all lots um, and quadruplex dwellings on arterial streets when an affordable housing unit is provided. Um, the districts also allow um, certain non-residential uses such as places of worship, schools, and um, the reuse of existing neighborhood commercial establishments. So um, this is a big change. Currently, our um, neighborhood one type districts um, allow single family and occasionally duplexes on lots. And so this is implementing what's in the conference of plan by adding those duplexes and triplexes on all lots. Um, won't get too far into this, but wanna make you aware that we do have proposed standards dealing with height of the duplexes and triplexes um, to try to make the height context sensitive. So the, um, the height of the sidewall, and that would be the side of um, the buildings, your, your home that faces your next door neighbor's home is um, 12 feet or the average height of adjacent buildings, whichever is greater. And we have heard a lot of comments on this. We'd like to know what people think about this comp concept. We've had folks suggest that maybe that 12 feet is not quite enough. So it would be great to hear um, what you guys think about that. And you can increase your height for additional side setback um, as well. So there is some provision for that. That works better for larger lots probably than smaller lots. Um, but looking particularly at height for duplex and triplex structures, again, to make sure that we have neighborhood compatibility. Next slide. A couple of alternative development options in the UDO. We have a conservation residential development, which was, is an updated version and somewhat different, but with the same intent um, from our current cluster provisions to preserve um, natural features on a site and gives the ability to have um, somewhat smaller lots if you do that. And we also have an updated version of our voluntary mixed income bonus that is designed to promote affordable housing. Next slide. Um, I mentioned a while ago, so I won't go back into this, but we do have these um, three um, new uh, overlay districts that are um, optional, not required that anyone use them, but they are tools out there uh, to allow different housing forms and apply to the N1A through N1E districts. Parking. Um, this, we have a little bit different approach to parking. You can see this in more detail in Article 19 of the UDO. We have a three-tiered approach that we are proposing. The first tier is our more vehicularly oriented um, sites and zoning districts, um, where you have a minimum off-street parking requirements and we don't have any maximum parking limits. So you can provide um, whatever is, is deemed necessary, but you do have a minimum. The second tier has both minimum and maximum parking requirements. So you, in that case with these districts, you have to provide at least a certain amount of parking for the ordinance, but you can't go over the cap on parking. And the third tier is our most um, urban districts. And for these districts, you have no parking minimum for most uses. Um, there are a few uses where we do have um, parking minimums. And you also have, uh, well, you do have, in all cases, maximum parking limits. So these are the areas where they have the greatest potential in the near term to be multimodal and where we think it's, it's most important to manage the amount of, of parking, the maximum amount of parking. 
Next slide. Um, another thing that's been added to the UDO is electric vehicle charging stations and um, won't go through the details, but just know that this is in here. It applies to certain uses where you um, would be required per our proposal to um, have a certain number of um, EV capable and EV ready spaces and occasionally EV installed spaces. And those EV installed spaces don't count towards your pack parking maximum. Um, and also count as two spaces if you have a, park, a minimum parking requirement. Uh, we also have standards relating, relating to the location of surface parking and access to that, and that differs by zoning district. So we may in some cases say you can't park between your building um, and the street um, on all, certain or all frontages. And um, this is something we have in some of our zoning districts now. We've expanded that approach a little bit more. Again, designed to make our community more walkable. If you don't have to walk through parking to get to the front door of your building, it makes for a um, much more pleasant walk. Uh, we are occasionally getting some comments on some of these standards, so we appreciate any feedback you have on these. Next slide. We also have standards for the design of parking structures, and these um, are based on your zoning district and your the street frontage that that portion of the parking deck is fronting. Um, and depending on your zoning district and frontage, there are four options, some of which, um, well, they probably all don't apply in all cases, but you may say for your N2C, if it's on a main street, you would have option A and B. You could um, use either of those for the design of your parking structure. So you can go through the tables and see, based on your zoning district and frontage, what options you, you might wanna select. Next slide. Um, a little bit about landscaping and screening. This is an article 21. Um, you can read the types of landscaping and screening we have. Biggest thing if you're used to using our current ordinance is um, buffers, what we currently call buffers are now called landscape yards to differentiate from other types of buffers um, that we have in the ordinance. Next slide. Um, and landscape yards are really to provide separation between uses where those uses are um, not ideally compatible. So you may have um, an industrial facility next to um, a multifamily project. We wanna make sure that there's an adequate transition and protection of that multifamily project while still accommodating that industrial facility. And there are certain times when this kicks in. And again, um, this is, um, can be found in article 15. Next slide. Um, and then we have three types of landscape yards that you can find in the ordinance. Um, a, B, and C, and as I mentioned, these are, um, well, I maybe didn't mention this. These are based on your zoning district, what your proposed use is, what the abutting use is, and then based on those factors, you determine whether um, the requirements are for a landscape yard A, landscape yard B, or landscape yard C. And occasionally in the prescribed conditions, we require landscape yards for specific conditions, and so you can find those controls in um, table 21-3 as well. Next slide. Um, nearing the end of zoning, open space requirements. We do have open space requirements. In the UDO, they are a little bit different from what's in our current ordinance. They're really designed to be for usable open space. And you can find that in table 16.1, um, the design of open space organized by type. And then the actual requirements for the amount of open space are found within each zoning district. We do have um, some uses for open space really, maybe the usable open space does not make sense. So we have exempted some of those um, types of uses. Next slide. Uh, so a little bit more information. This is a table pulled out of the, the draft ordinance for employment and center zoning districts. And you can see that for example, if you look at this um, CG and CR, two of the commercial districts, 
total amount of open space required is 5% of the site. And then with commercial development, half of that would need to be public, available to the public to use um, for that site. So the, these tables are in the ordinance, so you can see, um, based on your zoning district, what open space is required. Um, and we also have uh, design standards for the open space. And I think it's important to note that the UDO is, intends to provide a lot of flexibility on the location um, and design of the open space. So your open spaces in most cases could be located on decks, porches, patios, rooftops, um, doesn't have to be on the ground eating up um, part of your site, but has a lot of locations where this could be. And again, designed to provide flexibility as long as the usable open space is being provided on site. Next slide. Okay, um, at this point, I'm going to hand this over to Andrew, uh, Andrew Ossel, who is gonna talk about stormwater and natural resources. Thank you, Laura. Um, can everybody hear, I guess you can, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so I'll preface everything that I'm about to present by saying that uh, we, we already did a lot of presenting on uh, the stormwater and the trees uh, requirements. Um, in general, we kind of did an overview earlier in uh, December and January. And so the, the slides today are gonna key in on um, some maybe higher level or um, more sort of more uh, explanations of sort of how these are going to apply to development scenarios or maybe get into some of the guidelines and some of the uh, review processes that uh, people have been asking questions about. So you can go to the next slide, please. So the first uh, thing we want to highlight is in Article 24, uh, we have new drainage requirements uh, that are, they're, they're not entirely new. So it, currently subdivisions and commercial development go through uh, drainage review. And so the UDO is going to um, have a process for reviewing some smaller projects uh, that will include your smaller residential projects and things that, that may not get reviewed today um, because we're finding in the community there's um, drainage impacts with a lot of infill, de infill development that we're seeing. Um, but what we're hearing from folks is they're concerned that maybe a smaller project that they're doing in their backyard uh, may trigger uh, some complicated uh, drainage review. And, and what we're presenting here, what we want to show folks is that the, the, the review process for your drainage projects are gonna fall into a tiered approach. So if you have minimal or no impact to existing drainage um, or the infrastructure that's in your yard, that's gonna fall into a tier one, tier one review where there's, there's not gonna be a need for engineering sealed, sealed drawings or design requirements. Um, it's gonna be a pretty simple process to get those approved. Now, if you are um, providing new storm drainage uh, or other impacts to existing drainage or other infrastructure, um, that's where you see it's going to fall into tier two or tier three, which is going to have some higher design standards and um, some engineering assistance required to uh, make sure that there aren't downstream impacts to, to neighbors and to other community members. So just, just making sure that we have uh, adequate drainage infrastructure provided. Um, you can go to the next slide. The second big change that we're uh, proposing in the UDO is change to the post-construction stormwater requirements. Um, the current applicability threshold, so when a project would need to go in for review for compliance with that article, um, is, is kind of complicated. There's a square footage requirement that's pretty large, 20,000 square feet is pretty large um, for commercial projects and then a percentage requirement that if you're adding a certain number of, a certain percentage of built upon area, um, you, you would have to comply with post-construction. Um, in the UDO, we're gonna have one consistent lower uh, threshold for, for all development. And there's several reasons for that, uh, that we kind of outlined in the presentation that we did on January 5th. Um, but the, the, the main point is that we're lowering that threshold for post-construction, making it consistent. Next slide. Uh, and there are a couple other key changes to our stormwater articles. Um, the, 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 the most, or this is to post construction. Um, there were mitigation options that were available um, for certain developments in certain areas of the city. Those are going away to make a consistent application of the requirements for all development. Um, 
There were some natural area requirements, so you just had to preserve some area on site for natural vegetation that was existing. Um, a lot of that's done by our tree article, and so we're translating that over to Article 29 by increasing some standards in that article. And then there are going to be changes to uh, sort of how built upon area can be placed in uh, water quality buffers. So, um, you know, there's there, there's an allowance in the UDO for uh, built upon area to be uh, 15 feet away from the stream bank. Next slide. Uh, real quickly, this is kind of a roadmap for where we're going on uh, to, as we talk about Article 29 tree protection. Um, the big the big changes are uh, simplifying applicability, getting rid of exemptions um, or some exemptions. Tree save is transitioning to something we're calling green area. Uh, we'll talk about what that means. Um, and then centers, quarters, and wedges and place types, we'll talk about that. Um, Heritage tree protection is also something we'll cover today. That's a, one of our more talked about requirements that uh, hopefully there's some good uh, guidance that we'll talk about in, in this presentation. Next slide. So uh, the, what we say by article trigger is what we mean, what we, what we mean by that is it's what size of project applies or needs to comply uh, with the tree article. And so you can see in our current ordinance, we have a couple of kind of complicated uh, me measures of uh, applicability. And so parking spaces and uh, if you change a certain percentage of your building facade, um, today would require compliance with the tree article. We're, we're kind of going away from that and we're having a, a sort of a cleaner applicability where if you're adding a new structure, you're increasing the built upon area or building coverage of your site or you're uh, submitting a sort of a new subdivision, you, you would have to comply with the tree article. Next slide. The exemptions, what you can see here in this table is uh, sort of three types of projects that um, today are exempt from certain requirements. And then um, you can see in the orange column what, what the UDO is proposing. So if you're constructing a single family or duplex structure today, um, you would be exempt from tree save or what we're calling green area and, and some tree planting requirements. Um, in the in the UDO and the UDO we're present, proposing to keep that exemption for single family and duplex when when those structures aren't being proposed as a part of a new subdivision, um, and we're also adding triplex and quadruplex developments to align with the 2040 comprehensive plan's policy to increase housing diversity. Um, projects that are zoned TOD and mud. Um, in transit station areas or in uh, uptown, the I-277 loop, today they're exempt from tree save. Um, and where we're going is we're gonna remove that exemption and require all sites to comply um, so that there is sort of um, a greater, you know, opportunity to increase green area in our city. Um, but those sites will be given a lot of flexibility and we'll talk about what that means in the next couple of slides. Next slide. Um, green area, you can see um, today what we require in terms of tree save or green area is 15% for commercial and then anywhere from 10 to, to 5 when there is lower tree canopy existing um, on single family sites. Uh, in the UDO, we're going to go to a consistent 15% required for all sites. Um, it's, a, it's a big change. It's something we want to highlight. Next slide. Another big change to tree save is we're going away from centers, corners, and wedges. And so all that really means is it's, it's sort of a, uh, a, a categorization um, mechanism that we use to, to split up the city um, into three different areas. And, um, you know, in today's ordinance, if you're a center, you get a lot of flexibility. If you're in a wedge, you get less. So wedge, think single family neighborhoods. When you're in a center, think uptown, think um, your more high activity centers. Um, today's ordinance also considers things like zoning and land, land use, and that can get complicated in terms of understanding what, what options are uh, available to you. In the UDO, we're going to a simple um, sort of categorization based on place type. So um, you're, it, every site will have a place type as a part of the uh, 2040 policy map effort. And so um, Depending on what place type you're in, we, we place tiers uh, in the in the tree article to sort sort of explain, um, you know, tier one sites are going to have more flexibility. They're going to have more options for complying with green area, 
and our tier four sites are going to have uh, significantly less options. And I'll show you what that means, I think, on our next slide. You can see it here. The text might be small on your screen. I apologize for that. But um, essentially, the green area credit table shows you what you can do to meet that 15% green area on site. Um, if you're a tier one site, any, any box here that has a number in it, it that's available to you as an option. Um, tree save can be used on, on any uh, site to meet green area. Um, you, can, you can use that. It's, it's the same thing. Um, and, and we're trying to educate folks that, you know, though we are changing the name from tree save to green area, by and large, tree save is still going to be used to, to meet green area uh, in Charlotte. So that's a key point. And then the other point we're going to bring up is that incent there's going to be incentive credit in the UDO for higher quality trees. So if you're saving trees on a steep slope or uh, adjacent to a, an existing tree save area, um, those trees are sort of higher quality and they provide more ecological benefits. So we're going to give uh, those, those areas uh, sort of a higher credit. Go to the next slide. And then the last thing that I'll talk about is heritage tree protection. Uh, you may have heard a lot about this, um, this requirement. And uh, there's a lot of questions in terms of what we would allow as a city. There's, there's going to be a requirement to get a permit for removal of trees that are native to North Carolina and they're greater than 30 inches diameter. So those are pretty large trees. Um, and, and so uh, there, there will be several criteria for granting a permit. You can see here those sort of scenarios where we would grant a permit. Um, and those include that the structure being proposed uh, can't reasonably be relocated um, and that the heritage tree would be severely impacted if the addition were to go forward or the, the building structure uh, were constructed. Um, if the tree location conflicts with or an ordinance requirement or utilities or um, you know, some other infrastructure, uh, the tree would be granted for removal. Um, and then the other big component that we're trying to uh, educate folks on is that uh, there's a sort of an allowance that if the tree is located in a spot where it makes up 49% of your, um, your site that, uh, or your buildable area, it, it could be given a permit for removal as well. And so um, that, that's really the gist of it. If the tree is diseased or dying, uh, the removal is not required or the permit is not required, um, but you know, certainly could be applied for all the same. So um, you can remove an unhealthy tree, uh, no problem at all. And we're working to, yeah, educate folks on that. So I'll go to the next slide. I think that's it for me. I'll hand it off to Kevin May. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I appreciate that. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm going to uh, present to you the, for, through the next few slides some of the key areas of interest in the draft subdivision streets and other infrastructure language of the UDO um, so that as well as some reference points so that uh, you can really key in as you review the draft UDO and um, obviously if you'd like to engage and perhaps provide us feedback through our public comment portal as well. Next slide. So I'd like to talk a little bit about new uh, collector and local streets and uh, very often how we get a lot of our street network and our connectivity is through these new collector and local streets. Uh, and when they're established as a development project goes to the subdivision process. Uh, going forward in an effort to try to maximize um, our street network and connectivity, we're proposing that there be a wider applicability uh, for these street requirements so that uh, projects that don't necessarily maybe uh, go through the subdu su so, excuse me, subdivision process may also have to provide for these as well. Um, so not, that only not, not only serves the community, but uh, that's, that comes to us via a recent change in state law that allows uh, the ability uh, for this type of requirement for zoning approvals outside of just uh, going through the subdivision process. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you can see there the reference in the draft language. Next slide. Uh, for another couple of classifications of streets are arterials and limited access roads. Uh, on the previous slide, we talked about collector and local streets. Those are usually built by development as development occurs. Uh, these arterials and limited access roads are usually constructed by uh, public agencies. And where development may uh, be along a corridor where an arterial or limited access road uh, is planned, 
Uh, an 18 month reservation would be required, uh, which would commence at that land development approval for that development. Uh, alternatively, if uh, a project were to dedicate, excuse me, dedicate that corridor space, uh, they would, el would be eligible for a reduction in the minimum lot size for development in the neighborhood, neighborhood one place type by 10%. Next slide. Uh, a key component, uh, a key, uh, I guess, partner component that supports the UDO is the streets manual, uh, which is housed uh, in the um, strategic mobility plan. And the UDO references the streets manual uh, really in many, many places, but three very important pieces where the streets manual is mentioned is with regard to the Charlotte streets map. Uh, which uh, I just finished talking about arterials. The Charlotte Streets map defines the future cross sections of those arterial streets. Uh, and then also uh, it's mentioned as part of the comprehensive transportation review. Uh, this is very important because this is uh, proposed to replace the city's current traffic impact study guidelines. And really the comprehensive transportation review is the process and the lens through which development will be looked at for potential mitigation of uh, transportation effects that development may have in its area and the surrounding areas. And then lastly, um, the streets manual also has a driveway and access rules piece. Uh, you can see there uh, the reference point in uh, the draft UDO language, but I'm going to speak a little bit more about that in just a second. And I do want to point out that uh, the streets manual is not part of the UDO. It's, it's a separate process, but it's, it's in support of the UDO. Um, and you can see there's a link there at the bottom of this slide uh, that uh, will bring you to a location to where you can review and provide comment on that. And uh, the streets manual project and process, at least for public comment, is going to mirror the UDO's uh, comment period. Uh, but with when it comes to adoption, it is being that it's a separate project, it will be uh, taken up for consideration for adoption separate and outside of the UDO process. Next slide. So I mentioned I wanted to circle back to driveways very briefly, uh, and I just wanted to give a little bit more detail about that. We, we currently have regulatory language with regards to driveways and access, uh, but what we've done with the draft UDO is to bring some of that existing really regulatory language, bring it uh, into the UDO, and, and really by uh, by doing this, we, we more formalize the review and approval of new and existing driveways. Um, and again, with that kind of supporting rule, that the streets manual has for the UDO. Uh, this, you can also find most driveway and access details uh, for this in the streets manual, as well as the turn lane requirements. Next slide. One of the uh, pretty interesting new concepts uh, that is generating a little bit of feedback is this concept of cross access. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this where it may already exist um, between developments in the physical world, uh, but going forward, we'd like to see this uh, more throughout our community because it provides a safe and comfortable access for pedestrian cyclists and kind of also cuts down on motor vehicles having to exit from, say, one development and get out to traffic to, to reach uh, an adjacent development. And that's what this is proposing to do is to require connections between developments where it may be required to try to provide that safety access and, and maybe cut down a little bit on the congestion of the roadways. Next slide. Um, also with regard to access, um, another key component or another uh, concept being proposed in the draft UDO is this public access to trails. And the, the purpose of this and in, in recognizing that you know, open space and green space is important and certainly mobility options are important. It, this is a way to connect uh, the streets to a park or off-street public path, allowing the public uh, access to those facilities um, with greater frequency. And these would be required depending on the length of frontage of a development um, and be put uh, into an easement and managed through an easement. Um, it's important to note for development projects that this is not an addition necessarily to other access that may be required. This public access to trails may also be combined with those other required access points. Next slide. And then lastly, another new concept is relocating curb and gutter. Um, 
this currently is achieved a lot through the results of a traffic impact study, through some conditional rezonings and through some driveway plan approval. Uh, going forward is proposed to apply on a wider applicability to buy right development um, with the caveat that that's scaled to reflect uh, development projects and their location. And, and then even more um, in consideration of that, the draft UDO also includes exceptions and modifications in some instances uh, to that relocation of curb and gutter. And just very importantly, I do wanna point out that even though that there are exceptions and modifications for flexibility built into our draft UDO, they do not necessarily override the future curb location uh, as indicated from the Charlotte streets map. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand off to Sandra Montgomery who will speak about administration, Sandy. Thank you, Kevin. I'm Sandra Montgomery. I've spearheaded the administration articles. So with that, next slide. I'm gonna go over some of the key changes um, in the draft UDO. Uh, one of the major ones is the creation of a UDO administrator. Um, here's a, a chart showing in the middle of the, the uh, diagram, the six zone administrators that we have now. Um, and the different articles that they um, uh, are in direct um, supervision over those articles. Um, the role of the administ UDO administrator is not to supervise these six uh, existing administrators, but to administer the overall UDO. And um, those would be, that would be articles one and two and 36 through 40 that they would actually man, he, he or she would actually uh, manage. Um, also managing the UDO Board of Adjustment, Variances and Appeals, and the UDO Administrator would re resolve any conflicting regulations that might be in the UDO. As for the role of the six existing administrators, each of them will administer, again, the specific articles that are shown in the TO boxes. Next slide. Along with that, I mentioned the creation of a UDO Board of Adjustment. Uh, currently, variances and appeals are heard by three different bodies, uh, the Zoning Board of Adjustment, Stormwater Advisory Committee, and the Charlotte Mecklenburg Planning Commission. In the UDO moving forward, we propose um, a UDO Board of Adjustment that would handle variances, variances and appeals, um, except they, the UDO Board of Adjustment would only recommend approval for major watershed variance requests. Um, those would actually be uh, approved by the North Carolina Environmental Management Commission. Next slide. Um, a new element of the UDO proposed is uh, currently the, uh, there's no expiration of pendings, text amendment petitions or rezoning petitions. Um, in the proposed UDO, both tax amendment petitions and zoning map amendment petitions will expire if no decision has been reached within two years of the submittal date. Next slide. The EX zoning district, currently we have uh, the Todd EX exception zoning district. This is a mechanism for altering and modifying minimum standards when Todd standards can't be accommodated. This is for items such as new development concept, concepts or special problems or unique proposals and circumstances. Uh, the Todd EX does include a bonus menu of voluntary actions for obtaining additional height, reduction of required open space, on site and an increase in the maximum building length. TOD EX is a conditional process with review standards. Next slide. Moving forward, the EX district is, is proposed to be expanded and allowed in 13 different zoning districts through the conditional process. Again, it is a mechanism for altering and modifying quantitative zoning and street cross-section standards when they can't be accommodated. Again, for new development concepts, special problems, innovative designs, standards cannot be waived in their entirety, and there are no modifications permitted to uses or maximum height regulations. Public benefits must all be, also be provided 
um, in sustainability, public amenity, or city public improvements. Next slide. Community meetings, there's an, going to be um, expansion of requirements for community meetings. Currently, these meetings are only required for conditional rezoning, zoning map amendments. Proposed, the community meetings will be required for all zoning map amendments, including conventional. Next slide. Uh, administrative adjustments. Currently, um, zoning quantitative measures can be adjusted by up to 5% in the RE3, PED, and TS districts, and up to 10% in the TOD districts. For non-quantitative measures in zoning, minor alterations are allowed in the RE3, PED, and TS districts if the changes involve an innovative design approach and align with the intent of the districts. Um, zoning adjustments also um, currently can be approved for handicap ramps, encroachments that are make a development compliant with ADA requirements, and encroachments for restoration or replacement of features on an existing historic structure in a historic district. Next slide. Moving forward, administrative adjustments are proposed for up to 10% of quantitative standards for zoning, tree, and tree standards. The SSI standard, streets, subdivision, and infrastructure, um, was considered originally to have administrative adjustments, but that has been excluded in the draft. I uh, just wanted to point that out. There are no adjustments for bonus provisions, density, signs, or conditions on an approved conditional or EX site plan. And again, administrative adjustments moving forward can be applied for handicap ramps, encroachments, and an up to two foot adjustment is allowed for frontages, side and rear setbacks and landscape guards uh, if they remove a practical difficulty. There will be a notification of abutting property own owners moving forward for administrative adjustments. And of course, there's conditions for approval. Next slide. We also have broadened permit choice rules. These um, are in effect now, but I do want to point them out because they will be in the draft also. Uh, when a permit application is submitted for development and after that application is submitted, but before the decision is reached on the permit, an ordinance is amended then the applicant can choose which version of that ordinance, either the older version or the former one, or the new version applies to the use of the land and the application. This was amended in June of last year. And then moving forward also in the same situation, if a development requires multiple permits, the applicant chooses which version of the amended ordinance will apply at the time of the initial permit application. That version choice then applies to subsequent permit applications submitted within 18 months of approval of the initial permit. And with that, next slide. And with that, I'll turn it over to Laura Harmon. Laura? Thank you, Sandy. Um, just we did get some questions related to how we would transition from the current regulations to the UDO. I um, want to talk briefly about that and let you know more to come as we're continuing to work through this. Um, we are looking at an effective date um, somewhere one to three months, probably, um, but after the adoption date, so council would adopt, um, and then we'd be looking at an effective date after that. I talked earlier about zoning translation. So on that affecting effective date, a property zoning would translate from well, an old district to a new district if they're conventionally zoned. Sandy just talked about permit choice and also wanted to mention that conditional rezonings um, would be, if they're submitted in advance of the approval of the UDO, we would be carrying those forward and allowing those um, to move forward even under the old zoning districts, uh, again, if they are conditional rezoning. With that, I'll turn it over to Mariah.
Mariah, you're still muted. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Laura. I'm just going to go ahead and cover a couple of um, UDO resources that you may find helpful. Um, so as Andrew um, spoke to and Kevin mentioned again, um, the best place to provide your comments here on the draft are through our website. Um, we have an online portal set up where you can go in and make comments um, by section. Um, and so uh, if something here stood out to you in particular, you can go ahead and um, head to our website and read um, those specific sections of the UDO and then again, um, comment there on that platform. Um, on our website, you'll also find a 26 page reference guide. Um, this document is meant to help you find um, specific topics on, um, help you find information on specific topics or zoning districts that you might need more information about. It also breaks down some of the regulatory concepts um, that may not be familiar to everyone. The website is also the gateway to our recently released Choose Your Interest educational videos. Uh, these videos discuss what the UDO draft means for different scenarios. Um, and we have videos aimed at explaining what changes um, the UDO could mean for existing neighborhoods, new neighborhoods, existing businesses, and new development. Um, we encourage you to check those out and share them um, with your network. And so just to recap, the first draft of the UDO was released in October, um, and we will be accepting comments on the first draft through March 18th um, on our online platform. We will also be hosting additional virtual conversations um, and some other engagement opportunities um, on the first draft through mid-March. Potential topics for those virtual conversations include uh, short-term rentals, heritage trees, parking, um, and neighborhood zoning district standards. We're, again, we're still working to finalize um, those topics and the schedule, but we will be releasing that soon. Um, and then also, again, if something here piqued your interest, um, it's possible that we covered it um, previously in one of our past virtual conversations. So we encourage you to check out our website. Uh, you can find recordings of each of those um, there as well. Um, and with that, I'd just like to thank you all for being here. Uh, we appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing you at a future uh, virtual conversation. Thank you.